We're live. We're live. Good evening and welcome and thank you for tuning in to our virtual town hall event on safe and supportive learning environments. I am Daryl Williams, superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools. Joining me tonight for this important conversation, we have Dr. Michael Zarchin, the Chief of School Climate and Safety, Ms. Patricia Mustafer, Coordinator of School Social Work Services, Ms. April Lewis, Executive Director of School Safety. Joining us, we have Sergeant Thomas and Captain Brown of Baltimore County Public Schools, uh, excuse me, Baltimore County Police Department, and Mr. Howard Franklin, pupil personnel worker in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services. I would like to begin our conversation with the Compass, our Pathway to Excellence, which is our eight-year strategic plan adopted in July of 2020. The challenges brought forth with this pandemic have only strengthened our resolve to achieve our equity policy by raising the academic bar, closing gaps, and preparing students for success in the future. The Compass provides the clarity we need to support the academic and social emotional wellness of each of our children. Based on broad feedback, the Compass identifies five priorities, learning accountability and results, safe and supportive environment, high performing workforce and alignment of human capital, community engagement and partnerships, and operational excellence. This all encompassing agenda is the work of every member of Team BCPS. This evening, we will be focusing on one focus area that is safe and supportive environment, but it impacts the other four focus areas. We're also elevating focus area four, community engagement and partnerships. Tonight's conversation on student and safe and staff safety isn't unique to Baltimore County Public Schools. School systems across the nation are grappling with these same questions and challenges. How do we continue to foster safe and supportive learning environments considering the myriad of challenges our students and families are facing as a result of the pandemic? It is documented that school districts are struggling with behavior issues as students return to school buildings after more than 18 months in virtual learning. School across the country report that they're seeing an uptick in disruptive behaviors and experts are saying this is a reflection of the stress the pandemic placed on children. I know as parents, students, staff and community members, you are tuning in tonight because you are concerned, have questions, or want to learn more about what BCPS is doing to ensure the safety of students and staff. Our presenters this evening will walk you through our comprehensive, proactive approach on safety and climate and highlight cross-agency collaborations that make this work possible. I want you to know that you are our partners in this critical work, and we are committed to hearing from you and working with you to ensure BCPS schools are a place where all students can thrive. I will now turn it over to Dr. Michael Zarchin, Chief of School Climate and Safety. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening and welcome to our first virtual town hall meeting. In addition to serving as Chief of School Climate and Safety, I have the honor as, of serving as moderator for our town hall meeting tonight. We have planned this meeting to be informative and will strive for continuous improvement in each of our subsequent meetings. Thank you for joining us. The Division of School Climate and Safety works to foster safe, secure and supportive learning and working environment 
for all students and staff throughout Baltimore County Public Schools. We work to coordinate multiple system-wide initiatives that support health and safety, as well as the social, emotional, and academic growth of students. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our health services team has taken a vital role in working to provide vaccinations, contact tracing, and training around mitigation practices and important safety considerations. This work has been done in collaboration with the Baltimore County Department of Health, Maryland Department of Health, and in close consultation with health, health experts from Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland. Staff from the Department of Social Emotional Support and the Department of School Safety have expanded social and emotional supports, engaged staff in positive behavior planning, provided guidance for navigating the COVID-19 pandemic, worked to engage students in learning, and partnered with other divisions as well as external agencies to enhance safety. Staff responsible for leading these efforts include school nurses, school counselors, pupil per personnel workers, school psychologists, school safety managers, and school social workers. Additionally, BCPS enjoys a strong partnership with Baltimore County Police, through which 83 school resource officers, also known as SROs, are funded and assigned. Why we share the responsibility for each focus area of the compass, our pathway to excellence, the work of the Division of School Climate and Safety is strongly anchored in focus area two, safe, and supportive environment. The key initiatives that drive our work include student and staff supports, positive school and workplace climates, safe and supportive environments for learning and working, and emergency preparedness. Strategies to provide these initiatives center around behavioral resources, supportive personnel, a multi-tiered system of academic and behavioral supports, social emotional learning standards, and safety protocols. We also work to provide emergency response and professional learning. Staff in the Division of School Climate and Safety work collaboratively with schools and departments across BCPS to ensure that all members of Team BCPS contribute to and benefit from safe, and supportive learning and working environments. I now have the pleasure to welcome Ms. Mustafer, Coordinator of School Social Work Services, to share information on social emotional learning and supports available to our students. Ms. Mustafer. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. The journey of social emotional learning begins with the vision in the Compass Our Pathway to Excellence that was referenced by both Dr. Williams and Dr. Sargent. We want to share with you that the vision for social emotional wellness is that within every BCPS learning space, students and adults will acquire and apply social emotional skills that provide them equitable opportunities and access to engage deeply in cognitively demanding and collaborative workspaces. Positive student to student, student to adult, adult to adult relationships and connections will strengthen our community. The social and emotional learning framework centers equity with three core competencies that are essential to attitudes and skills necessary for understanding and managing emotions, listening, feeling, and showing empathy for others, as well as making thoughtful, responsible decisions. And this is important now more than ever. As we think about the variety of emotions experienced at present by both our children and for us as adults, we must acknowledge that our children take their lead from us, their parents, teachers, administrators, and caretakers. It is essential that our collective awareness consists of the concept of social emotional learning, which is a process where critical power skills are leveraged to support a balance of emotional wellness and success in life. 
Individuals who have met with lived experience, such as the dual pandemic of COVID and social unrest, have been adversely impacted socially and emotionally. SEL is the opportunity to increase individual capacity by learning and developing skills that engage and support the regulation of emotions to facilitate positive interaction in navigating our responses to various forms of stress. The document connecting as a collective community is BCPS's social emotional learning plan that is in alignment with the BCPS priorities and whole child approaches, focusing on the social emotional well-being of the entire school community. This guidance document outlines goals, outcomes, administrator actions, staff actions, and student actions to intentionally and explicitly incorporate SEL into not only academics, but also behavioral health to build equitable systems that support all students in accessing resources essential to success. This resource can be located on the Department of Social Emotional Support's webpage and includes a variety of activities like the virtual calming room that offers strategies for all ages and stages of ways in which to pause and calm oneself. And the Mind Over Matters campaign that highlights the importance of social, emotional, and mental health awareness. Accessible resources are one of the components available. Also, there are alignment of professional learning, coaching, problem solving, and resources that are necessary to build adult competence in meeting the needs of the whole child. Members of the Division of School Climate and Safety, in partnership with other offices, have prioritized these efforts in supporting the co-creation of the plan, curating and providing professional learning that is supported with resources, such as monthly social emotional learning calendars, one pagers, look for tools, activities for implementation on a daily basis, all towards the application and expanding school practice in meeting the needs of the whole child. Additionally, collaboration with schools, towards implementation and coaching of school teams and staff to, to promote conditions for teaching and learning towards fostering growing student skills within their lived experience to be applied across environments, both school and at home. While SEL alone cannot mitigate all the stressors that we've experienced, what we know is that can, it can mitigate the harmful effects of toxic stress and trauma when implemented at a prevention level in the instructional environment. Keeping in mind this fact, SEL and mental health are not interchangeable terms. SEL is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and attitudes to navigate their worlds. Let's take a moment to think about addressing mental health needs that are present when a child's emotional or behavioral presentation are more intense, frequent, and longer in duration than other children of the chronological age where emotions or behaviors impair functioning in daily life activities. Consideration during these times for accessing interventions, supports, and resources is important to each student and their family. This can take shape through connecting with adults, therapeutic interventions, referrals, connecting with our community partners through the student support team process. We encourage parents to extend to their student support teams to identify the resources that most appropriately, most appropriately meet your child's needs. The slide in front of you identifies how SEL is part of a tiered system of supports for all students in their lived experience. We know that social emotional wellness enhances a developing mind and its capacity to integrate skills, attitudes, and behaviors effectively into daily tasks and challenges. And at the same time, we also know that there is a need to provide supports for all children across the tiers as referenced. Now we will hear from Ms. April Lewis, Executive Director of School Safety. Thank you, Ms. Muster, uh, Muster for, I'm sorry, and good evening, everyone. So how is our work in facilitating safe and supportive environments grounded? State law provides guidance under COMAR to which we are legally bound. Board policies and superintendent's rules are created 
and implemented in alignment with COMAR, encompassing activities across the continuum of prevention, intervention, and logical consequences. For example, zero tolerance policies were banned during the 2014-2015 school year, and BCPS made changes in alignment with MSDE mandates and COMAR. As Dr. Williams and Dr. Zarchin shared, the strategic plan includes safe and supportive environments as one of its focus areas, addressing the physical environment as well as the social emotional environment. The comprehensive safety plan lays the foundation for safety from prevention, response, mitigation, and emergency management perspectives. The first three volumes are available on the BCPS website for public viewing and a link provided in the chat, while the last five volumes are only available to staff for safety and security reasons. The first volume contains an overview of the rest of the document to provide assurance to all stakeholders that BCPS is prepared to address a variety of emergency situations often in partnership with other county agencies, such as the Baltimore County Police Department and the Baltimore County Fire Department. The student handbook, which students and families receive annually, is a guide for parents and students to assure their understanding of student behavioral expectations, interventions, and consequences, as well as their rights and responsibilities. Annual presentations by school staff are given to lend clarity to the document and afford students and parents an opportunity to ask questions. Ms. Mustafer talked to you already about the SEL 30-day reentry plan, an effort to support students and staff upon their reentry. You will hear from our Assistant Safe Schools liaison shortly as she highlights the partnership between BCPS and the Baltimore County Police Department to implement the School Resource Officer Program as well as other supports. The Guide to Safe Schools for School Resource Officers and School Administrators delineates the responsibilities of each agency, including how they pertain to discipline and criminal behaviors. You might also ask, what staff are involved in doing this important work? Great question. The answer is all of us and all of you as well. School safety is our priority and I'm sure it is yours. Some staff have specific responsibilities for working in schools and or with staff to support students. Volume three of the Comprehensive Safety Plan identifies various individuals who have roles in school safety. At the school level, this includes school counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, and school social workers. Along with PPWs and SROs, all serve on the school's behavior threat assessment team to assess and respond to threats of harm to self, others, or property. From central office, we have pupil personnel workers. You will hear from one of our stars in a few minutes and school safety managers who are on call 24 seven to support schools in creating emergency plans, responding to safety concerns and working with students and parents to resolve conflict. We also have student conduct hearing officers who serve as the superintendent's designees presiding over student disciplinary hearings, adjudicating cases, and administering extended suspensions and expulsions when appropriate. And of course, we have many community partnerships that support the physical, social, emotional, and behavioral health of students. I'm going to turn to our Assistant Safe Schools Liaison now to share more about our partnership with law enforcement. Sergeant Thomas. You're muted, Sergeant Thomas. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis. Our school resource officers are Baltimore County police officers that are assigned to every middle and high school. Our elementary school SROs float between elementary schools within their precinct area. 
All school resource officers are required to take a state mandated 40 hour training required by the Safe to Learn Act of 2018. SROs work in collaboration with school administration, staff, and students to keep schools safe. As Ms. Lewis stated, safety is everyone's priority. SROs receive a variety of training. They receive training from our police department, which is yearly in-service training. Some of this training includes working with people with disabilities, firearms training, active shooter training, legal updates, community policing, diversity training, traffic laws, use of force training, and any training that may be relevant to that year. SROs also participate in school-based training, such as the Safe Schools Conference with administrators, as well as the National Association of School Resource Officers Conference. The, that training includes training such as youth development, crime prevention through environmental design, equity training, and also advanced school resource officer training, just to name a few. The Safe Schools Facilitator and Assistant Safe Schools Facilitator work in collaboration with the Department of School Safety and Baltimore County Public Schools. Oftentimes, we are handling after-hour calls that may concern threats against students or staff. We work in coordination with BCPS administrators, zone managers, and our IST detectives to help resolve those issues to ensure a safe opening to schools. Crossing guards, are also assigned and managed by the Baltimore County Police Department. Typically, a request can be made from a school if a crossing guard is needed at a certain area for safety. We also support Baltimore County Public Schools on various committees, such as the Steering Committee, the Threat Assessment Committee, Critical Incident Response Team. Our Mobile Projects and Behavioral Assessment Team also work closely with Baltimore County public school system in the event that we have to investigate threats or students that may be considering self-harm. Our SROs also introduce conflict resolution or mediation whenever there's an issue between school students. They also participate in the conferences as well, along with administrators. SROs also handle incidents that involve missing students in collaboration with Baltimore County public schools and with community members. Next, I would like to introduce Mr. Howard Franklin, pupil personnel worker. Thank you and good evening. As part of the division of school climate and safety, pupil personnel workers or PPWs support students, families, and school personnel. PPWs knowledge of student support services, instructional programs, services available to schools, students, and families within BCPS and knowledge of services offered by community agencies, in addition to knowing policy, law, and counseling techniques, puts PPWs in a unique position to work as a provider and coordinator of services and implement proactive strategies designed to present or resolve issues that may arise. For the purpose of this town hall meeting, we will be examining the supportive roles PPWs play in maintaining safe learning environments and in promoting positive school climates. It might help you this evening to think about what I'm sharing through the lens of behavior. Pupil personnel workers are another layer of support and intervention afforded to families, students, and schools relating to behavior. Through consultation and coordination and equitable solution-focused practices, PPWs provide another perspective and level of intervention in addition to school-based and resource staff. Pupil personnel workers work within a multi-tiered system of support framework, which was referenced earlier by Mrs. Mustafer in the discussion of social emotional learning and supports. When supporting students, families, and schools around positive behavior and climate, PPWs operate along a, a continuum that includes prevention, intervention, and restoration, which offers supports that impact all students and families. If a barrier pre presents, targeted and customized supports and interventions are developed and implemented. Taking a look at the slide, you will notice there are three broad categories of work PPWs do to support students families and schools around positive behavior 
and climate. Within each category are examples of supports and interventions, as I mentioned, all of which fall in the prevention, intervention, and restoration continuum and vary in intensity based on the situation and the need. In taking a look at the slide, the first category, direct and indirect services and case management, PPWs help their assigned schools in developing their school-wide positive behavior plans and or school-wide PBIS plans. Both of these plans include evidence-based frameworks designed to support all students. They also include a flexible continuum that allows for customization based on need. PPWs conduct home visits and a variety of meetings. The type of meetings PPWs facilitate is specific to a particular intervention, but are always grounded in an effort to remove barriers, maximize student success, and ensure the safety of others. As we move to the second category, home, and, home school, and community liaison, PPWs consult with families and school-based personnel to initiate referrals to the appropriate community agencies when additional resources and supports are necessary. PPWs serve as liaisons with these agencies to coordinate the exchange of information. Some of the uh, agencies that we work with frequently are Family Navigator, Baltimore County Conflict Resolution Center, Department of Social Services, Department of Juvenile Services, Hope Health, and other mental health providers. PPWs serve as an advocate for students and their families who have been referred to student conduct hearing officers for behavioral supports and or program reviews. The last slide titled school support, as PPWs seek to support positive school climates where all students can thrive in a safe, nurturing, academically enriched environment, BCPS recognizes the importance of relationships. Such relationships are fostered through our work with commitment to restorative practices. The importance of and strengthening of relationships, collaborative problem-solving responsibility, change, and growth are all hallmarks of restorative practices. BCPS staff receive ongoing training in restorative practices, and PPWs work with schools to co-facilitate restorative conferences as another layer of intervention. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Zarchin. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. I wanna thank our presenters. We hope that you found the information shared useful. I also wanna stress that this is just the first step. The town hall for secondary families will begin at 7.15. We'll host additional town hall conversations organized by geographical zones in the coming weeks. We also want to make certain that the critical information is accessible by members of the community who speak other languages. A Spanish version of the program will be posted on the BCPS website and the BCPS TV YouTube channel in the coming days. We will also have resources and frequently asked questions posted on the BCPS website in the coming weeks. And now we're moving to our question and answer portion of tonight's town hall. As a reminder, members of the BCPS community had an opportunity to submit questions in advance, and we received more than 100 questions. We're also going to answer some of the questions that you, the viewers, submit in the chat box. We're going to do our best to get to as many questions as possible. For those questions we're unable to answer, we'll provide answers in the FAQs document. Our first question this evening is for Ms. Lewis. Ms. Lewis, a parent asks, what is BCPS doing to prevent or stop bullying in schools? Thank you, Dr. Zarchin, for that question. So preventing or stopping bullying, which includes cyberbullying, involves actions on the part of staff, students, and families. You're probably aware that October is National Bullying Prevention Month, a time during which we focus on bullying prevention for students and staff. For staff, it's about participating in professional development 
to make sure that they can recognize bullying, know how to intervene, as well as investigate and protect students. On October 20th, National Bullying Prevention Day, we will release an annual bullying awareness training for all staff. School counselors are currently going into elementary classrooms, kindergarten through grade five, sharing information about bullying through bullying prevention lessons. Health education is another topic in which students learn about bullying and resolving conflict. At grades kindergarten through five, students begin to develop the skills that will help them understand appropriate relationships, as well as specifically looking at bullying in grades one and four. We also have a student-inspired year-long Mind Over Matters campaign that Ms. Mustafer mentioned. Students and staff engage in activities to bring attention to this very important topic. In my opening remarks, I mentioned policies and rules to ground our work. We have a policy and a rule, 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation that provides definitions, responsibilities for reporting and investigating, and prohibitions against retaliation. We included a link in the, to the BHI form for reporting. We also distinguish between bullying, conflict, and other inappropriate behaviors. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Don't go anywhere yet. The second question <laughs> is also yours. Okay. You. So our next question, what is BCPS doing to address the need for additional security staff in schools in light of the recent increase in incidents? So our schools utilize a team approach to school safety that includes the partnership with the SRO program as needed. Most of their work in elementary schools, however, falls under their roles as mentors and informal teachers. Principals are security officers for their schools. They and their school-based teams are equipped to keep our elementary schools and students safe. If they need outside resources for a specific event, they are able to reach out to their school safety manager or their school SRO for support. They can also contact the local precinct when they require support from them as well. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Our next question has to do with restorative practices, so I'm going to turn to Ms. Mustafer. The question is, how long has BCPS been utilizing restorative practices and what data is being collected to show that it's effective promoting safe spaces? As a follow-up, what is the continuum of restorative practices? So two questions there for you. Got it. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. We've received, I, I feel like, multiple questions about restorative practices. Um, and, and just to give context, restorative practices, we started um, exploring and um, providing professional learning around the continuum of restorative practices um, in 2018. Um, implementation of a continuum of RP, as we reference it, um, from use of effective language to impromptu conversations to formal conferencing is predicated on the needs of the school community. And so many of us hear about restorative practices and most of us think, let's circle up. The practice of circling is one component that is versatile, um, that is a versatile restorative practice that can be used proactively to develop re relationships, build community, um, or to respond to wrongdoing, conflicts, and problems. Um, earlier, you heard uh, from uh, Mr. Franklin, who spoke to the use of circles in problem solving with families and in problem solving issues related to student behavior. Circles give individuals an opportunity to speak and listen to one another in an atmosphere of safety and decorum and equality. 
There's a wealth of professional learning that's offered from central office and locally to school level for schools in practice. When we think about efforts to support the needs of our communities in repair and restoration, our efforts have expanded in training and implementation. As we reference, pupil personnel workers, school, school conduct hearing officers, and our SROs. Um, we want to make sure that we're acknowledging, um, surfacing the reality, repairing, and restoring our communities when harm has been done. There are also times where we engage our community partners um, at the Conflict Resolution Center and community conferencing to support conferencing as well. Thank you very much. If you could stay on, we, we have a, another question for you, and this is about the Behavior Threat Assessment Team. Uh, Ms. Muster, if you, if you could, the question is, is there one in every school or each zone? How are they trained and how are they activated? And that's the Behavior Threat Assessment Team. Sure. Um, in alignment with BCPS policy and rule 3720, there are two tiers to the behavior threat assessment team. The first tier is the system-wide behavior threat assessment team that needs to review the existing practices and um, data to support consideration of resources towards implementation. The second is the behavior, the school level behavior threat assessment team. And yes, every school has a behavior threat assessment team, or what we fondly reference, BTAT. Um, it is a multidisciplinary team comprised of a host of student support personnel um, that Ms. Lewis referenced earlier. But just as a friendly reminder, um, those teams are comprised of the school administrator, school nurse, social workers, psychologists, counselors, PPWs, and school resource officers. This is a time. This is a team that, in times of crisis, are prepared to respond in managing a, a threat, assess students for threats to self and others, and then collaborate towards a response. The BTAT team also debriefs any situation that occurs and considers the collective response towards any other need that presents. The BTAT, is con the BTAT team conducts regular meetings to focus on assisting in establishing processes and structures at the school level, identifying existing support resources, and then completing referrals to appropriate community resources that are within our partnerships. Thank you, and if you could hold on for one more question. Uh, we've got another question now. This is about the traumatic loss team. So a community member wants to know who's part of the team. Is there one team for the whole county? And, and when are they activated? So um, traumatic loss team is unfortunate as it is our communities do experience traumas and they do experience losses. And the traumatic loss team um, is a team of stu student support professionals that provide various levels of support at the school schools when there is a traumatic event or a loss. The team leads um, in partnership with school leadership when there, when there is such an event. There are teams across BCPS to serve schools when there is a need. During COVID and over the last year, we have continued with these teams, even in a virtual um, space. And when permissible, with COVID mitigation, of course, the teams engaged in being present with the school community. Thank you you again. Um, so the next question I'm going to ask Mr. Franklin to come on screen. Uh, Ms. Mustafer, you may want to add to this as well. I think um, you have some good insight for this question as well. So the question from a community member is, how does BCPS use services of Baltimore County Conflict Resolution Center? Is it promoted as a resource for schoolhouse staff and families? Uh, thank you, Dr. Zarchin. As a school counselor and as a PPW, I've had firsthand experience with um, the Baltimore County Community Resolution Center. We've enjoyed a really long relationship and partnership with, with this organization. Um, they've been around for so long that they're the, the way people basically find out about them in terms of schools is done through the through 
professional development and meeting with different stakeholders in, in the system. Community, con uh, community conferencing itself, it's helpful to think of that as being youth-based. Uh, it's a very powerful social justice process, has a lot of the, the beliefs and precepts of restorative practices where individuals are brought together that have been impacted by a conflict and they, they come together under the auspice of trying to resolve the situation in a safe and structured space. Um, community conferencing can be accessed by anyone. Schools can make referrals and individuals can make referrals. They're a little more difficult when an individual makes a referral outside of a school only because you have to provide all the information about the other families in terms of their addresses, their email addresses. But none, nonetheless, it, it can be done, a referral can be made by school or by the individuals. Another amazing uh, service that the Baltimore County Conflict Resolution Center provides is um, the individual education plan facilitation for students and families who have I, who, for students of and families who have students of who have IEPs. This can be a really challenging process, and the Baltimore County Conflict Resolution Center offers trained IEP facilitators that help to make the process more effective. The IEP facilitators through uh, the Baltimore County Conflict Resolution Center, they're not advocates or decision makers at all. They just, they're a neutral third party who supports the work of the entire group. In this case also, schools can refer as well as families. Um, another service that they offer is mediation. I told you that for, um, for community conferencing, it's, it's helpful to think of it as youth-based. For mediation, it's, it's helpful to think of it through a community-based lens. Uh, these are used to address problems and or situations that need resolution. It could be for things as neighborhood disputes, creating co-parenting plans, um, addressing elder care issues, or even improving teen parent uh, communications. They actually work, um, they have a lot of referrals in terms of mediation from the Baltimore County to Police Department, uh, the state's attorney and self-referrals can also be made. It's a wonderful, wonderful organization that does amazing work to support our schools, our families, and our students. Thank you, I Mr. Think, Franklin. I think the one thing I would ask, add there is that um, they've been, in addition to what Mr. Franklin said, they offer a wealth of resources and they are a wonderful partner. And many times, um, in our growth and, and in our own learning about implementation of restoration um, and repair and restoration, we've consulted with them many times. So um, that offers us the opportunity to continue to grow in our practice, but also to lean into our partners um, to lend information, structure, and support to students and families. Thank you once again. So the next question from a parent, I'm going to ask Ms. Lewis to join us again. The question is, I'm wondering why as a parent, I see so many videos on social media of fights in public schools, and there seems to be no repercussions for students that are fighting. Please walk us through the punishment, the punishment that would be for a kid who is caught fighting another kid in school. Then explain how can these repercussions be more stringent? Thank you for that question, Dr. Zarjan. And of course, fights is something um, that concerns us all, and we've all seen the social media post of fights. We're more likely uh, to see fights posted to social media involving secondary students, although it does sometimes happen with elementary school students. And for many people, unfortunately, it serves as a source of entertainment, and so they post and they share. Fighting among students is a problem that usually starts with unresolved conflicts. With elementary age students, this can um, result from something that occurred in the community or that's something that happened at school. We know that adults are key in helping students understand appropriate ways to deal with conflict involving adults they trust before their behaviors become physical. There are consequences for fighting in our policies, rules, and outlined in the student handbook. Administrators, however, handle these on a case-by-case -case basis based on the situation. 
Remember I mentioned earlier that we don't have zero tolerance policies, which would treat every situation the same way. Rather, administrators look at each individual case of fighting and apply consequences as appropriate for that situation. Consequences can range from conferences to lost privileges, detention, suspensions. I'm also going to ask Ms. Mustafer to come back in and just talk to you a little bit about how staff might work with elementary school age students as they get involved with fights through that tiered system of supports that she described in her initial presentation. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. When we consider the whole child and their lived experience, and that relates to fighting or any um, conflict between students, we have to remember that one size does not fit all. Um, our focus as a space of learning is to support educating students in their awareness, relationships, and decision making. At the elementary level, we really focus on advancing social emotional learning to grow these competencies, which are critical to relationships and how we engage each other, as well as how we problem solve. At the, at, at the elementary school level, we utilize the three SEL signature practices in our instruction. We are also using mindfulness, again, referencing what was spoke of earlier, of the pause to take calm and to self-regulate where we are in space. And the practice of conscious discipline, Students access these critical SEL practices during their instructional day that is inclusive of problem solving and self-regulation elements to support students in their problem solving prior to and following a difficult situation towards repairing harm and restoring community. These practices are, are com complemented by student support team members providing whole class and small group lessons to reinforce social emotional skills. It's really critical that we continue to build our learning and our knowledge as we figure out the social structures that are around us, because that helps us navigate in success. And sometimes that requires explicit teaching. Thank you for that. Thank you. Sergeant Thomas, given the question that Ms. Lewis and Ms. Mustafer just addressed, this may be a good opportunity to address the role of the SRO and the importance of the program. Uh, we've received a number of questions about the SROs. Um, can you give us an overview of the work and, and what it looks like day to day? So day to day, our school resource officers report to the police station, which is where they're assigned. They pick up their vehicle and they immediately go to the school. Many of them will assist administrators as kids are arriving to school by greeting kids, helping to secure the premises, ensuring that kids are getting into the school safely, checking doors, and just providing that additional support to administrators. The primary roles for school resource officers is teaching, mentoring, and law enforcement. So we expect our SROs to participate in the mentoring process as well. Many SROs are successful with um, recruiting students to become police officers or for younger students to join our youth leadership program. Um, our SROs are also involved in conflict resolution, the restorative practices. Um, they also assist our social workers whenever there are any incidents that are concerning any students should arise. Many times our students are comfortable going straight to an SRO to talk about issues because the SROs have developed that rapport. So they're there as an additional resource to the school, the community, as well as the students. And we encourage our SROs to have an open door policy for students as well as staff to come in to talk about anything that they would like to talk about. Thank you. We have another parent who wanted to know if SROs are trained on race sensitivity and equity. Could you address that, please? Yes, so our school resource officers, again, are Baltimore County police officers, and they receive training through Police Academy. They receive diversity training. They participate in candid conversations. We have a chief diversity officer who started with our department about two years ago who's implementing more training for our police officers. In addition, several of our SROs participated in the Baltimore County Public Schools equity training, which is a training that we will be working in collaboration with the Department of School Safety and BCPS 
to bring back to our new SROs who have not had the opportunity to participate in BCPS's equity training. However, they do receive this type of training from the police department. Thank you. And I know that a big part of your work has to do with staying up with the latest trends, concerns that may surface uh, in the community or nationally. A parent wanted to find out more about the Devious Licks Challenge that called for students to engage in highly disruptive and be violent behavior like destroying bathrooms or hitting staff members. The parent wants to know what are we doing to stop students from participating in these activities like the TikTok challenge? Well, we worked myself and our safe schools facilitator worked closely with the Baltimore County Public School Systems Department of School Safety to provide communication out to parents to advise them that if students are in fact caught participating in any of these types of activities, that will result in destruction of property or assaulting staff members, not only will they be facing uh, school consequences, they may be facing criminal charges or consequences regarding that. Um, as again, we work with students. We also work to educate students on why these things are not appropriate for school, why these things are uh, unsafe in the school environment. So therefore, we did have to assist with the communication to go out to parents to talk to your children about these incidents. These are not incidents that are specific to Baltimore County Public Schools. We had a meeting with school resource officers, supervisors for all Maryland jurisdictions, and they too are experiencing some of these same issues. In fact, the um, TikTok Devious Lick Challenge has also been talked about on the news. So it's an unfortunate incident that is happening everywhere. We've consulted with our Maryland Center for School Safety for advice as well um, on how to deal with these issues. So if there is a student who is caught doing these types or participating in these types of issues, we will work in collaboration with Baltimore County Public Schools as well as the victim to decide what next steps would be. Thank you. And another question regarding the TikTok challenge and devious licks. Do you feel that secondary students understand that these incidents are not going to be tolerated and will be taken seriously? I'm hoping that they do. Um, after the after the communication went out to parents, um, I want to strongly, strongly suggest to the parents who are listening to what we're talking about today. Please talk to your students. Many of the incidents and the issues that we're talking about um, sometimes are occurring in the community and they make their way back into the school building. So we are encouraging parents to please talk to your students about these issues and what potential consequences could be if these issues should occur on school property. Thank you. And we've got one more question. This one's from YouTube. Will SROs eventually be trained on using the same strategies that schools are using with a child that has high behaviors um, or, you know, incidents in the school? Well, SROs are trained by the Baltimore County Police Department to work with students with disabilities, students who have um, social and emotional issues, students with autism, just a variety of, of different challenges that we see. They also receive some school-based training through the state-mandated 40-hour training, which is required by the Safe to Learn Act of 2018. They also receive training from the Safe Schools Conference, in addition to the National Association for, Schools of Resource, for School Resource Officers. So all of the training that the SROs receive will incorporate some of those issues when working with students um, who display those types of behaviors. We also encourage those officers to do positive reinforcement with the students as well. We want them to connect with the students, to build a rapport. Many of our officers will sit in the cafeteria and have lunch with the students. Many of the officers will even treat the students to uh, a lunch, bring a lunch to school for the students, sort of as a reward for good behavior. Or uh, many of our officers also do things such as coaching after school activities. Some of them even sponsor various groups in schools, such as the, um, the step squad groups or um, groups where students want to uh, raise awareness to a specific issue. Some of our school resource officers will stay behind on their own time, sit with the groups of students so that they can discuss any concerns or issues that they may have, or even sponsor the group or whatever the student's cause may be, as long as it is in coordination with Baltimore County Public Schools. 
Thank you. So I, I, I want to publicly thank you for your, your cooperation, coordination, and partnership with BCPS. I, I, the one thing that I don't think is, is always seen in the work or, or acknowledged is the relationships with students, young and old. So thank you so much for your work. So our next question also from YouTube uh, is for Ms. Mustafer. Are there workshops offered for parents on the SEL instruction taking place in school in order to reinforce the strategies at home? Thank you. Um, that's a great question. And yes, the answer is yes. So um, we work in collaboration with Parent University, um, offering various um, opportunities for parents um, to engage in learning around conscious discipline, restorative practices. We've also partnered um, with PTAs, uh, going out to schools at their requests to support them in understanding what are the SEL practices and how can we embrace those practices in supporting our um, children and our communities. Um, sometimes it's just communities um, members who want more information so that they can integrate that language or just have a working knowledge so that they are able to speak the same language that the children are using. Um, so yes, there are lots of opportunities. I encourage you to go to the main BCPS website um, and look up Parent University and you will find a host of opportunities. The other option is to um, reach out to Parent University um, if you um, have an interest that you don't see present there. Um, as well as to talk with your school and see what opportunities they're offering as well. So I'm going to jump in because we have heard a lot of information and I want to turn. Um, we have less than four minutes left, but I want to turn to our presenters. We have parents here tonight. They have children at our elementary school level. What one advice would you give to our parents? I'll start. Um, I would advise parents to make sure that they're talking to their children daily about what has happened in school, what concerns them, that they stay in constant communication um, with their teachers, the administrators, we want to resolve issues before they get to a point that we're then looking at some of the things that we have talked about tonight. And sometimes children will hold on to things, but when you start to have those conversations with them around the dinner table and, you know, relating to them about your experiences, perhaps that will help them to reveal what's going on with them, the conflicts that are happening in the community that someone mentioned that often come into school. And so talking to your children on a daily basis is what I would recommend and probing, not just accepting nothing as the answer. What happened today? Nothing. Something did happen today and let's talk about it. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. How about one more presenter? I, I would definitely offer um, in response to your question, Dr. Williams, we're partners in the work. We are children's first teacher, and um, we are always looking for partners in the work. Um, as, as wonderful as it is, and as at times uncomfortable as it is, we are always looking for that collaboration and partnership. And, and I've always felt that um, we are always working towards the greater good for each of our children and collectively as a BCPS community. Thank you. I saw Mr. Howard Franklin, 30 seconds. <laughs> I just wanted to add uh, to tap into what Mrs. Mustafer said, that is communication is also a two way street. If there are things at home that you know are on the horizon that can head off a problem before it comes to the school, giving the school a heads up does a lot to stop things before they spiral. Just keeping keeping the school community informed as you learn things that might be happening. Thank you. And I can't forget Sergeant Thomas. First, I'd like to start off by saying we're hiring. So <laughs> for, the, for those who are listening, um, and I, I would just um, just add to what everyone else is saying. 
work with us. Um, you know, we have SROs in schools, but that's one or two people. We need everybody to help with school security. So again, if you see something, say something. Please let us know. Please feel free to contact your SRO at any time if you have any issue that you want to discuss that they can assist you with. If they don't have the answer, they can point you in the right direction. Just work with us. Thank you. Well, thank you all for joining us this evening, and I hope our parents are walking away with additional resources and or insights about our collective work to help our students achieve. Well, we're not finished. We will continue to have additional opportunities to discuss and problem solve. So stay tuned for upcoming dates in the near future. We will partner with our stakeholders and our school leaders to plan other events to assist our schools and school communities. Dr. Zarchin, any closing comments? I just want to thank everybody who's on the call, presenters, parents, community members. My piece of advice is to get involved, stay involved. It, it When they leave elementary school, they're going to push back a little bit. But behind that, they need you involved just as much, if not more, when they get to middle school and high school. So you've already taken the first step. We appreciate you joining us and uh, look forward to the next town hall. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.
Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Welcome. And thank you and for thank tuning you. in to our virtual town hall event on safe and supportive learning environments. I'm Daryl Williams, superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools. Joining me tonight for this important conversation are Dr. Michael Zarchin, chief of our school climate and safety, Ms. Patricia Mustafer, coordinator, school social work services, Ms. April Lewis, executive director in school safety, Sergeant Thomas, Baltimore County Police Department, also Captain Brown, Baltimore County Police Department, and Mr. Howard Franklin, our pupil personnel worker in the Office of Pupil Personnel Services. I would like to begin our conversation with the Compass, our Pathway to Excellence, which is our eight-year strategic plan adopted in July of 2020. The challenges brought forth with this pandemic have only strengthened our resolve to achieve our equity policy by raising the academic bar, closing gaps, and preparing students for success in the future. The Compass provides the clarity we need to support the academic and social emotional wellness of each of our children. Based on broad feedback, the Compass identifies five priorities. Learning accountability and results, safe and supportive environment, high performing workforce and alignment of human capital, community engagement and partnerships, and operational excellence. This all encompassing agenda is the work of every member of Team BCPS. This evening, we will be focusing on one focus area, safe and supportive environment, but impacts the other four focus areas. We're also elevating focus area four, community engagement and partnerships. Tonight's conversation on student and safety student and staff safety isn't unique to Baltimore County Public Schools. School systems across the nation are grappling with these same questions and challenges. How do we continue to foster safe and supportive learning environments considering the myriad of challenges our students and families are facing as a result of the pandemic? It is documented that school districts are struggling with behavior issues as students return to school buildings after more than 18 months in virtual learning. Schools across the country report that they're seeing an uptick in disruptive behaviors and experts are saying this is a reflection of the stress the pandemic placed on children. So I know as parents, students, staff and community members you are tuning in tonight because you're concerned have questions and want to learn more about what bcps is doing to ensure the safety of students and staff our presenters this evening will walk you through a comprehensive proactive approach on safety and climate and highlight cross agency collaborations that make this work possible I want you to know that you are our partners in this critical work, and we are committed to hearing from you and working with you to ensure BCPS schools are a place where all students can thrive. I will now turn it over to Dr. Michael Zarchin, Chief of School Climate and Safety. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Zarchin. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening and welcome to our second virtual town hall meeting. In addition to serving as chief of school climate and safety, I have the honor of serving as moderator for our town hall meeting tonight. We have planned this meeting to be informative and helpful. We greatly appreciate you joining us. The Division of School Climate and Safety works to foster safe, secure, and supportive learning and working environments for all students and staff throughout Baltimore County Public Schools. We work to coordinate multiple system-wide initiatives that support health and safety, as well as, oh, excuse me, 
health and safety, as well as social, emotional, and academic growth of our students. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our health services team has taken a vital role working to provide vaccinations, contact tracing, and training around mitigation practice and important safety considerations. This work has been done in collaboration with the Baltimore County Department of Health, Maryland Department of Health, and in close consultation with health experts from Johns Hopkins and the University of Maryland. Staff from the Department of Social Emotional Support and the Department of School Safety have expanded social and emotional supports, engaged staff in positive behavioral planning, provided guidance for navigating the COVID-19 pandemic, worked to engage students in learning, and partnered with other divisions as well as external agencies to enhance safety. Staff responsible for leading the efforts of this division include school counselors, pupil personnel workers, school nurses, school psychologists, school safety managers, and school social workers. Additionally, BCPS enjoys a strong partnership with the Baltimore County Police Department, through which 83 resource officers, school resource officers, or SROs are funded and assigned. While we share the responsibility for each focus area of the compass, our pathway to excellence, the work of the Division of School Climate and Safety is strongly anchored in focus area two, safe and supportive environment. The key initiatives that drive the work of our, our division include student and staff supports, positive school and workplace climates, safe and supportive environments, for learning and working and emergency preparedness. Strategies to provide these initiatives center around behavioral resources, supportive personnel, a multi-tiered system of academic and behavioral supports, social emotional learning standards, safety protocols, emergency response and professional learning. Staff in the Division of School Climate and Safety work collaboratively with schools and departments across BCPS to ensure that all members of Team BCPS contribute to and benefit from safe and supportive learning and working environments. I'd now like to welcome Ms. Mustafer, Coordinator of School Social Work Services, to share information on social emotional learning and supports. Ms. Mustafer. Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. The journey of social emotional learning begins with the vision in the compass, our pathway to excellence, that was referenced by both Dr. Williams and Dr. Zarchin. We wanna share with you that the vision for social emotional wellness is that within every BCPS learning space, students and adults will acquire and apply social emotional learning skills that provide them equitable opportunities and access to engage deeply in cognitively demanding and collaborative work. Positive student to student, student to adult, and adult to adult relationships and connections strengthen our communities. The social and emotional learning framework centers equity within three core competencies that are essential to the attitudes and skills necessary for understanding and managing emotions, listening, feeling and showing empathy for others, as well as making thoughtful and responsible decisions. And this is more important now than ever. As we think about the variety of emotions experienced by both our children and for us as adults, we must acknowledge that our children take their lead from us, their parents, their teachers, their administrators and caretakers. It's essential that our collective awareness consists of the concept that social emotional learning is a process where critical power skills are leveraged to support a balance of emotional wellness and success in life. Individuals when met with the lived experience, such as a dual pandemic of COVID and social unrest, have been adversely impacted both socially and emotionally. SEL is the opportunity to increase individual capacity by learning and developing skills 
that engage and support the regulation of emotions to facilitate positive interactions in navigating our responses to various forms of stress. The document on the slide, Connecting as a Collective Community, is BCPS's social emotional learning plan that is in alignment with the BCPS priorities and whole child approaches, focusing on the social and emotional wellness of the entire school community. This guidance document outlines goals, outcomes, administrator actions, staff actions, and student actions to intentionally and explicitly incorporate SEL into the instructional day and to add in behavioral health to build equitable systems that support all students accessing resources essential to success. This resource can be located on the Department of Social Emotional Supports webpage and includes activities like the virtual calming group that offers strategies for all ages and stages to take a pause and, and put that calm in one day, just to be self-regulated or to, to, to stop, just take one minute. And the Mind Over Matters campaign, the year-long campaign, it highlights the importance of social, emotional, and mental health awareness. Accessible resources are one component available. Also, there's alignment of professional learning, there's coaching, there's problem solving, and resources that are necessary to build adult competence in meeting the needs of the whole child. Members of the Division of School Climate and Safety in partnership with other offices have prioritized these efforts in supporting the co-creation of the plan, curating and providing professional learning that is supported with resources like social emotional learning calendars, one pagers, look for tools, activities for daily implementation towards social and emotional wellness. Additionally, collaboration with schools towards implementation and coaching of school teams and staff to promote conditions for teaching and learning towards fostering growing student skills within their lived experience to be applied across environments, not just school, but at home too. While SEL alone cannot mitigate all stressors, what we know is that it can mitigate the harmful effects of toxic stress and trauma when implemented at a universal level of prevention in the instructional environment. Keeping in mind this fact, what we definitely know is SEL and mental health are not interchangeable terms. SEL is the process through which all young people and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to navigate their worlds. Let's take a moment to just touch on addressing mental health needs that are present in a child's emotional or behavioral presentation. Often they're more intense, more frequent, and they're longer in duration than other children of the chronological age where emotions or behaviors impair daily functioning of life activities. Consideration for accessing interventions, supports, resources is critical for each student and can take the shape of connecting with an adult, therapeutic interventions, referrals, connecting with our community partners. We encourage parents to extend to their student support teams to identify the resources that are most appropriate to meet their children's needs. The slide in front of you identifies how SEL is part of a tiered system of supports for all students in their lived experience. We know that social emotional wellness enhances a developing mind and its capacity to integrate skills attitudes and behaviors effectively into daily tasks and challenges. At the same time, we also know that there's a need to provide supports for all children across all tiers as referenced previously. Now we will hear from Ms. April Lewis, Executive Director of School Safety. Thank you, Mrs. Mustafer, and good evening, everyone. So how is our work in facilitating safe and supported environments grounded? State law provides guidance to which we are legally bound. Board policies and superintendent's rules are created and implemented in alignment with COMAR, encompassing activities across the continuum of prevention, intervention, and logical consequences. For example, 
zero tolerance policies were banned during the 2014-2015 school year, and BCPS responded by making changes in alignment with MSDE mandates and COMAR. As Dr. Williams and Dr. Zarchin shared, the strategic plan includes safe and supportive environments as one of its focus areas, addressing the physical environment as well as the social emotional environment. The comprehensive safety plan lays the foundation for safety from prevention, response, mitigation, and emergency management perspectives. The first three volumes are available on the BCPS website for public viewing and a link provided in the chat, while the last five volumes are available only to staff for safety and security reasons. The first volume, however, contains an overview of the rest of the document to provide assurance to all stakeholders that BCPS is prepared to address a variety of emergency situations, often in partnership with other county agencies, such as the Baltimore County Police Department and the Baltimore County Fire Department. The Student Handbook, which students and families receive annually, is a guide for parents and students to assure their understanding of student behavioral expectations, interventions, and consequences, as well as their rights and responsibilities. Annual presentations by school staff are given to lend clarity to the document and afford students and parents an opportunity to ask questions. Mrs. Mustafa talked to you already about the SEL 30-day reentry plan and effort to support students and staff upon reentry. You will hear from our Assistant Safe Schools Facilitator shortly as she highlights the partnership between BCPS and the Baltimore County Police Department to implement the School Resource Officer Program as well as other supports. The Guide to Safe Schools for School Resource Officers and School Administrators delineates the responsibilities of each agency, including how they pertain to discipline and criminal behaviors. You might also ask, what staff are involved in doing this work? The answer is all of us and all of you as well. School safety is our priority, and I'm sure it is yours too. Some staff have specific responsibilities for working in schools and or with staff to support students. Volume three of the Comprehensive Safety Plan identifies various individuals across the system who have roles in school safety. At the school level, this includes school counselors, school nurses, school psychologists, and social workers. Along with pupil personnel workers and school resource officers, all serve on the school's behavior threat assessment team to assess and respond to threats of harm to self, others, or property. From central office, we have pu pupil personnel workers. You'll hear from one of our stars in a few moments, and school safety managers who are on call 24-7 to support schools in creating emergency plans, responding to safety concerns, and working with students and parents to resolve conflict. We also have student conduct hearing officers who serve as the superintendent's designees presiding over disciplinary hearings, adjudicating cases, and administering extended suspensions and expulsions when appropriate. And of course, we have many community partnerships that support the physical, social, emotional, and behavioral health of students. I'm going to turn now to our Assistant Safe Schools Facilitator to share more about our partnership with law enforcement. Sergeant Thomas. Thank you, Mrs. Lewis, and good evening, everyone. Our school resource officers are Baltimore County police officers that are assigned to every middle and high school. Our elementary school officers float between elementary schools within their precinct area. All SROs are required to take a 40 hour state mandated training that was implemented by the Safe to Learn Act of 2018. 
SROs work in collaboration with school administrators, students, and community members to provide safe and secure environments for our schools. Some of the training that our officers receive from our police department at yearly in-service training is working with people with disabilities, firearms training, active shooter training, legal updates, community policing, diversity training, traffic laws, use of force training, investigation and interrogation, and response to critical incidents. Our school resource officers are also fortunate to receive school-based training. They participate in the Safe Schools Conference with school administrators and counselors. They also participate at the National Association for School Resource Officers Conference. Our SROs learn about equity. They learn youth discipline or youth development, crime prevention through environmental design, advanced SRO training, and other school-based training. Our SROs are also very instrumental in supporting schools in after-hour events, such as coaching and mentoring. We also assist the Baltimore County Department of School Safety with handling school threats that may pose a significant safety issue to staff and students. We work in collaboration with zone safety managers and the executive director of school safety to ensure that we can provide a safe opening and environment for our students. Many times our detectives are also involved in investigating any cases that could potentially cause threat or harm to student and staff. Baltimore County also employs crossing guards. Crossing guards are requested by principals and the Office of Transportation, and they work in collaboration with our traffic management team. We also support the Baltimore County Public Schools with their steering committee, policy writing, protocol development, threat assessment, and critical incident response team. Other activities that SROs participate in is coaching students and also sponsoring certain groups that students would like sponsorship in. Our SROs are there to work in collaboration with the administration and to keep the school safe. But just to mention, safety is everyone's responsibility. So we would encourage our community members, if they see something, please say something and please report it. And please make a connection with your school resource officer. Next, I would like to introduce Mr. Howard Franklin, pupil personnel worker. Good evening and thank you. As part of the Division of School Climate and Safety, pupil personnel workers, or PPWs for short, support families, students, and schools. PPW's knowledge of student support services, instructional programs, services available to schools, students, and families within BCPS, community agencies outside of BCS, policy and law, and counseling techniques puts people personnel workers in a unique position to work as a provider and a coordinator of services and implement proactive strategies designed to prevent, prevent or resolve issues that may arise. For the purpose of this town hall meeting, we will be examining the supportive roles PPWs play in maintaining safe learning environments and promoting positive school climates. It might help to think about what I'm sharing this evening through the lens of behavior. People personnel workers are another layer of support and intervention afforded to students, families, and schools relating directly to behavior. Through consultation, coordination, and equitable solution-focused practices, PPWs provide another perspective and level of intervention in addition to school-based and resource staff. Pupil personnel workers work within a multi-tier system of support, which was referenced earlier by Mrs. Mustafer in her discussion of social emotional learning and supports. When supporting students, families, and schools around positive behavior and climate. PPWs operate along a continuum that includes prevention, intervention, and restoration, which offer supports that impact all students and families. If a barrier presents, targeted and customized supports and interventions are developed and implemented. Taking a look at the slide, you will notice there are three broad categories of work PPWs do to support students, families, and schools 
around positive behavior and a positive school climate. Within each category are examples of supports and interventions, as I mentioned, all of which fall under the prevention, intervention, restoration continuum and vary in intensity based on situation and need. In taking a look at the first category, direct and indirect services and case management, PPWs help their assigned schools in developing their school-wide positive behavior plans and or their school-wide PBIS plans. Both of these plans include evidence-based framework that are designed to support the success of all students. They're flexible enough to allow for customization based on need. PPWs also conduct home visits and facilitate a variety of meetings. The type of meeting a PPW facilitates is specific to a particular intervention, but are always grounded in an effort to remove barriers, maximize student success, and ensure the safety of others. As we move on to the second category, homeschool community liaison, PPWs consult with families and school-based personnel to initiate referrals to appropriate community agencies outside of BCPS when additional supports and resources are necessary. PPWs serve as the liaison between these agencies to coordinate the exchange of information. I personally work with several agencies outside of Baltimore County. They include Family Navigator, Baltimore County Conflict Resolution Center, Department of Social Services, Department of Juvenile Services, Hope Health, and other mental health providers. In addition, PPWs serve as an advocate for students and their families who have been referred to student conduct hearing officers for behavioral supports or program reviews. Finally, in the last category, school support. As BCPS seeks to support positive school climate where all students can thrive in a safe, nurturing, academically enriched environment, BCPS recognizes without a doubt the importance and power of relationships. Such relationships are fostered through our work, work with and commitment to restorative practices. The importance of strengthening relationships, collaborative problem solving, responsibility, change and growth are all hallmarks of restorative practices. BCPS staff receives ongoing training in restorative practices and PPWs often work with schools to co-facilitate restorative conferences as another layer of intervention. With that, I turn it over to Dr. Zarjan. Thank you, Mr. Franklin. I want to thank each of our presenters. We hope that you found the information shared useful. I also want to stress that tonight's conversation is just a first step. We had just hosted a session for elementary school families at 6 p.m. and plan to host additional town hall conversations organized by geographic zones in the coming weeks. We also want to make certain that this critical information is accessible by members of the community who speak other languages. A Spanish version of the program will be posted on the BCPS website and the BCPS TV YouTube channel in the coming days. We also have resources and frequently asked questions posted on the BCPS website in the coming weeks. At this time, we're going to move to our question and answer portion of the meeting. As a reminder, members of the BCPS community had an opportunity to submit questions in advance and we received more than 100 questions. We're also going to answer some of the questions that you, the viewers, submit in the chat box. We will do our best to get to as many questions as possible. For those questions we're unable to answer, we'll provide answers in the FAQs document. Our first question this evening is for Ms. Lewis, and I'm gonna ask that you stand Stand by because we've got a couple questions for you. Ms. Lewis, a parent asks, what is BCPS doing to prevent or stop bullying in schools? Thank you, Dr. Zarchin. And that's a very appropriate question, particularly because October is National Bullying Prevention Month. 
And so in preventing or stopping bullying, which includes cyberbullying, we use a team approach that includes all of us. Professional development is very important for our staff to make sure that they recognize bullying, know how to intervene, as well as how to investigate and protect students. So next Wednesday, which is October 20th, National Bullying Prevention Day, we're going to be releasing the annual bullying awareness training that all staff are mandated to take. School counselors in middle schools will be visiting classrooms by the end of December and delivering bullying prevention lessons. Health education is also a course in which students learn about bullying, resolving conflict, and developing relationship skills. We also have the student-inspired year-long Mind Over Matters campaign that Mrs. Mustafer mentioned earlier. It also covers the topic of bullying for our students. In my opening remarks, I mentioned that we have policies and rules and information in the student handbook that governs student behavior. That includes Rule 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation. And it also includes definitions, responsibilities for reporting and investigating, and also the prohibitions against retaliating against people who report. Uh, I believe there's a link in the chat to the bullying, harassment, intimidation form for reporting, along with making sure that students understand what bullying is. We also want to make sure that they understand what conflicts are and other inappropriate behavior. But whether it's classified as inappropriate behavior, conflict or bullying is something that schools are prepared to deal with. Thank you, and if you could hold on, I'd like to bring Sergeant Thomas in for the next question. Uh, the next question is, can we talk about some of the proactive work that we do to ensure students aren't bringing weapons into schools? And then what happens as soon as we are made aware of a weapon that gets into a building? So I believe the student handbook probably addresses weapons on school property. Mm -hmm. As far as anything proactive, um, it's no secret we, we don't have metal detectors in schools. Um, typically a student may report something and that's how the information will come to us. We do ask that our SROs educate students on um, prevention, educate students on consequences of criminal behavior. Our SROs are trained in street law, which uh, combines lessons around how to be a, a good citizen, how to report incidents, um, consequences when a law is broken. We also have our high school SROs, secondary SROs that will go into classrooms and talk about consequences, behaviors. Sometimes they'll act out scenarios with students and basically just educate them on the dangers of having a weapon in general, especially having a weapon on school property. If a student is caught with a weapon on school property, there is a possibility of criminal charges. Thank you, and I would like to add, I think this is a good opportunity um, to just talk to parents and ask you to talk to your children about joking about weapons. Uh, that's something that we have seen quite a bit this school year. Um, a student will say, oh, I have a gun or I have a list, and then they'll say, I'm just joking. And I think sometimes they don't realize the consequences of those behaviors because we take every one of them seriously. And so if someone says there's a weapon, we're going to investigate as if there is a weapon. And sometimes these things happen after the school day has ended and we're contacting law enforcement and they're going into homes and they're doing searches and checking backgrounds. I don't think that's something that you know families want to have happen, especially because this child is just saying something inappropriate, sometimes to get attention, sometimes to shock their friends. So it's important to communicate that those kinds of threats or jokes are taken seriously. We take weapons very seriously. Thank you. That question came to us from YouTube. Our next question, Ms. Lewis, don't go anywhere yet. 
Uh, we have one more question for you. Uh, what is BCPS doing to address the need for additional security staff in schools in light of the increase in incidents in schools? So Dr. Zarchin, when we get to our secondary schools, each school has at least one full-time SRO. And in addition to the full-time SROs, there are floater SROs that can be called upon if they're needed to support a school, as well as we know how to get in contact with our precincts for additional help. Administrators act as security guards. I'm sorry, administrators have access to security guards for after school activities. And you see that a lot um, with our athletic activities for those activities that occur outside of the school day when our SROs are not present. And so we are fortunate to have those 83 SROs that you talked about assigned to us, which is a larger number than some police departments in smaller areas. But if administrators need other support, we do have our safety managers. I mentioned they're on call 24 seven uh, to support, to help administrators um, deal with situations that are coming up in their schools. Absent additional personnel, we do focus on identifying and mitigating the causes of inappropriate behaviors. And Mrs. Mustafer described some of those for you earlier. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. You mentioned Ms. Mustafer's name and, and she's got the next question. Ms. Mustafer, the next question is, how long has BCPS been utilizing restorative practices and what is the data being collected to show that it's effective in promoting safe spaces? The continuum of uh, restorative practices has been in phases of uh, implementation since 2018. Um, and, and the implementation of a continuum of restorative practices from effective language to impromptu conversations to formal conferencing is really predicated on the needs of the school community. Many of us hear about restorative practices and we instantly go to let's circle up. Well, the continuum, the continuum is much more broad than that. Um, what I will offer is that the practice of circling is one com component that is a versatile restorative practice that can be used proactively to develop relationships, build community, or in a reactive approach to respond to wrongdoing, conflicts, and, and just challenges um, in any environment. Circles give people an opportunity um, to really speak and listen um, to one another in an atmosphere of safety, predictability, and connection. Um, there's a wealth of professional learning that's offered from central office as we have um, a cadre of trainers, of um, resource teachers and school social workers, a school psychologist in making these connections at the schoolhouse level. Um, when we think about efforts to support the needs of our communities in repair and restoration, um, these trainers really support that effort. Um, and when there are conferences that need to be held, uh, they are often instrumental in coaching and supporting those conferences in taking place. Um, we've also expanded our training to uh, make sure that we're inclusive of um, providing these services, restore and repair. Um, that's offered also by our pupil personnel workers, uh, school conduct hearing officers and SROs. Uh, there are also times where we engage our wonderful community partners at the Conflict Resolution Center and Community Conferencing. They have been instrumental in supporting our efforts towards conferencing, as well as um, the um, CDRUM through University of Maryland. Thank you, Ms. Mustafer. We have another question for you from a parent about the Behavioral Threat Assessment Team. Who makes up the, the BTAT? Is there one in every school or in each zone? And how are they trained? And how often are they activated? So in thinking about, as you said, BTAT, the Behavioral Threat Assessment Team that we fondly have nicknamed um, BTAT, um, in alignment with policy and rule 3720, the first, um, there are tiers of BTAT. And the first tier is the central office since actually system-wide BTAT team that meets to review the existing practices 
um, and the data that goes along with those practices. It also considers what resources are necessary towards implementation um, in meeting the needs of our students. The second tier is exactly what you asked about, Dr. Zarchin, which is at the school level. The behavior threat assessment teams at the school level is a multidisciplinary team. It's comprised of a host of support personnel, including your administrator, your school nurse, your school counselor, your school social worker, your PPW, um, the psychologist, our school resource officers, and, and some other members of the school team. This team that in times of crisis, they're always prepared to respond in managing a threat. They're also prepared to assess student threats to self and others and a collaborative response as well. They also debrief after any situations that occur and go through annual training so that they are ready to respond during times of crisis, especially those related to threats to self, others, or property. Thank you, Ms. Mustafer. The next question is for Ms. Lewis. Uh, Ms. Lewis, a parent asks, I'm wondering why as a parent, I see so many videos on social media of fights in public schools, and there seems to be no repercussions for the kids that are fighting. Please walk us through what the punishment would be for a kid who's caught fighting another student in school. Then please explain, how can these repercussions be more stringent? Thank you. And fights and, and fights posted on social media, are something that's concerning to all of us. Some of what we're seeing are fights and some are attacks on students. And there's a difference. Unfortunately, these disturbing images are seen as entertainment by some people, hence students post them. Many arise from incidents that occur in the community. Others are related to things that happen in schools. In terms of how they're handled, they are handled in accordance with board policies and superintendent's rules in alignment with COMAR. So there's a range of consequences based on the incident. And a fight that involves individuals who are equally involved is going to be classified as a category one offense and typically involves in-school consequences and sometimes suspension. If the incident is an unprovoked attack by one student on another, the incident is a category two offense and the consequences can be more se uh, severe, even leading to longer suspensions. But sometimes in addition to school discipline, law enforcement does get involved with charges of assault. I think one of the things that is difficult for parents and frustrating is the fact that administrators cannot share how a situation was handled. They can tell parents that it was handled and we recommend that they do, but they, they just can't say how it was handled because of privacy reasons. So responding to fights and attacks doesn't end with logical consequences. School staff want to prevent the behavior from recurring. And so some of the support staff mentioned earlier are key in resolving conflicts that lead to these types of incidents. Thank you, Ms. Lewis. Ms. Mustafer, this may be a good opportunity for you to speak to, the, to our commitment of looking at the whole picture and understanding that addressing behavioral incidents it's not just a matter of discipline, but our work to try to understand the whole child. Absolutely. So when we are considering, and, and we always center the whole child in their lived experience, we have to remember that one size does not fit all. Um, our focus as a space of learning is to really support the education of the student in their awareness, relationships, and their decision making. At the secondary level, you know, sometimes this takes various shapes. But what I will offer is that we are in the business of teaching. And so we are advancing SEL, social emotional learning, to grow these competencies using the three signature practices, mindfulness, the practice of restoration, and even logical consequences that prevail. Students access these critical social emotional learning practices during their instructional day. And um, are inclusive of problem solving, self-regulation, um, and elements of student support services. 
this really is to assist students in their problem solving and following a difficult situation towards repairing and restoring the community. These practices are complemented by student support team members providing tier one whole class lessons and sometimes small group interventions to reinforce social emotional skills. Thank you very much. And while we've got you, if you could start us with the next question, a parent on YouTube wants to know what is done to support students who may witness a fight and then feels unsafe. Absolutely. So when a student witnesses a, a fight or a situation, it's always having that conversation with that student, um, really, and trying to help them to control the environment that's around them, provide them assurance that there is safety, um, and working through processes. Um, that's not always easy, but it is something that we have a range of student support uh, professionals, from school counselors to school psychologists, um, even school social workers, people personnel workers. Sometimes it really takes that team approach to collectively support a student in their awareness and how they navigate the next steps in, in managing their emotions, but also managing how do they communicate what they saw? How do they problem solve what they saw? And then how do they navigate their learning environment um, with that experience? Sometimes it's also leaning into a restorative conversation. I saw this, this was the impact that it had on me. This is what I need to move forward. We encourage children to learn those processes, express themselves with that type of language so that they feel heard, they feel seen, and they feel like they know who the resources are to go to in their schools to get support and to lean on, even if it's just to have a conversation, but to make sure that during that time, they can access the resources that will allow them to access their instructional environment. Thank you so much for that response. Sergeant Thomas, given the nature of, of the question that Ms. Lewis and Ms. Mustafer just responded to, this may be a good opportunity. If you wouldn't mind sharing the role of the SRO and the importance of the program. So the SRO's role is teaching, mentoring, and law enforcement. It's important that we are there to work with administrators, community, and staff to build a rapport with students. Um, as mentioned in the previous session, we talked about how some students are more comfortable coming to the SRO and reporting incidents. If they are comfortable with going to the SRO, we would encourage them to do so. Many of our SROs have also worked in the community, so they're familiar with the students. They're familiar with the students' families. Uh, many of the officers work in patrol on their day off, so they keep that community connection, and they also encourage the students to come and talk to them. They also will talk about other programs that students may want to become part of, such as the Youth Leadership Academy. And SROs are also there to help keep those students, students safe who do witness incidents. So we would encourage the parents to talk to your students to use SROs as a point of contact. Thank you for that. And if you could stay on, we've got a couple more questions that we'd like you to respond to. Another parent asked, are SROs trained in race sensitivity and equity? Yes, so our Baltimore County Police Department does train officers in diversity training. Officers also participate in candid conversations. We also have a new chief diversity officer who's been implementing training around equity and diversity for the last couple of years. Fortunately, the SROs were able to participate in equity training. Uh, some of our newer SROs have not experienced the training yet, but we will be working with BCPS to experience the school-based training. However, they have received this type of training through the police department. In addition, the 40-hour state-mandated training includes a session on implicit bias. Thank you. And, and one more question for you. Um, we've got some questions about we know you stay in touch with the latest trends, what's going on in the community. Recently, there have been concerns about you know, the, the, the viral devious licks challenge, uh, the TikTok challenge. Can you talk about the work to, to prevent those things from happening and, and whether or not you feel like the students as a result of that work 
understand that it's going to be taken seriously and there are going to be consequences if they're involved in that type of behavior? Well, I think that we all know that none of us can control social media, um, unfortunately. What we did was we worked in collaboration with the Baltimore County School System to send out communication to parents and students, letting them know that there could be administrative consequences as well as criminal consequences if anyone is caught or witnessed destroying property or if anyone is assaulting people as a result of these challenges. So our role is to continuously educate students and staff on how to report these incidents, educate students and staff on the damage that these incidents cause. However, we will encourage parents, as we always do, please educate and speak with your students. Many issues come into the school that typically starts in the community. And as we always state, our, our first education for our students always starts at home. Um, we've also met with our school resource officer supervisors for the rest of the jurisdictions within Baltimore County. They're experiencing and seeing some of the same issues, such as this devious lick uh, TikTok challenge, and they too are communicating with parents. Please talk to your students about these before, you leave, before they leave the house every single morning and just let them know that BCPS, there could be consequences. There also could be consequences um, criminally. Thank you very much. And this question I'm going to open up to the group. Uh, this is a question from YouTube. What is the current process for students that are disruptive in class? Are they removed from the classroom? Um, Dr. Zarchan, I'll offer in response to that question. It really is predicated on the needs of the student and um, what is happening in that space. Some students um, are removed from the classroom and they go with adults so that they can problem solve and engage in discussing what's occurring, what their emotions are, how they're feeling, and then problem solve and set agreements to return to the learning environment. Sometimes students um, experience more challenging um, and significant response, emotional responses that, that dictate that um, other students may have to leave the classroom until the student is able to express his or her emotions. Um, and then everyone returns. Um, in some situations, they would have a class meeting and talk about what occurred um, and problem solve that out so that the, commun the class community supports the student. Um, there really is a range of responses that, that are offered, um, and many times it's um, the teachers having that authentic connection with their students um, and in relationship with their student, as well as the class community or at the elementary school level, the class family. Um, so I will offer that, that it, there is a range of response um, for students, and, and it really is predicated on the situation at hand. Thank you. At this point, I'd like to bring up another question. Um, Ms. Mustafer, I'm going to ask you to jump in on this one as well. A uh, parent wants to know at what age does BCPS start teaching students about the dangers of drugs and substance abuse? Absolutely. So um, we did, you know, this is one that I think is really interesting. I learned a little bit more about this. Um, the dangers of drugs and substance use is actually accessed very early on. Conversations are initiated actually in kindergarten um, when there's a discussion about medicine safety and teaching protective health skills. Um, so and that and that teaching extends. Um, throughout the duration of a student's um, career. Um, so what we also know is that in the health lessons is that elements of the practice of uh, conscious discipline, which honestly goes back to all of the social emotional learning components that talk about conflict resolution, how we handle our emotions, what our decision making is like, how we engage adults, um, effectively being in relationship with someone and communicating. These are all protective factors um, when we talk about substance abuse prevention. Um, and then prevention conversations, as I shared, continue throughout the child's school careers, school career. And one thing um, 
Additionally, is that in middle school, the DARE program um, provides information that related to substance use, um, and that's offered by our school resource officers. Thank you once again. Uh, the next question I'd like to ask Ms. Lewis to uh, join again. So the next question has to do with steps being taken to ensure that school buildings are equipped with the latest safety technology to protect children from an active shooter event. Thank you. And unfortunately, we have seen some of those incidents um, on the news recently. And so we're constantly evaluating and upgrading safety in our school buildings. One of the key strategies in strategies in the, the compass, excuse me, involves hardening strategies, something that provides added layers of protection. And our safety team and facilities management team uh, meet monthly to identify building needs and to seek and identify funding to support those needs. Uh, for example, we recently received um, a grant and we are upgrading our camera systems um, in some of our buildings. But we do have to keep in mind that technology is only as good as the people that are using it. For example, our exterior doors are kept in a locked position. We have a buzzer system that is used to identify visitors, screen them, and admit them once they're clear. However, we often see people standing and holding a door open for someone else who has not been cleared. And so it's important that we teach our students not to open doors for anyone. I've been to buildings and students have just opened the door for me, even though it seems rude and, you know, not to hold that door open and for our visitors not to hold the door open for other visitors. So this is a place where parents can help us when they visit a building. Don't allow anyone to hold the door open for you. Help us in educating, by, uh, educating them by telling them that each person must be screened individually to keep our staff and students safe. But in the unlikely event of an active shooter, our staff and students have practiced how they would respond. Thank you very much for your response and your work to ensure that our students are safe. Welcome back, Dr. Williams. Yes, yeah, so um, to our panel, I have a question. Um, sometimes we hear that our students at the secondary level don't really want their parents to be involved. In some cases, they say, I got it, mom, I got it, dad. You know, I even heard it from my own kids as they were matriculating through school. So to our presenters, what advice would you give? And I asked this question earlier. What advice would you give to our parents with uh, children at the secondary level? What one advice would you give? And we'll close out on this. I'll start. And I would say, don't step back just because they're in secondary school. Um, students need their parents to be involved from pre-kindergarten through grade 12 and have ongoing conversations with them and not just yes, no questions, ask open-ended questions and invite them to share with you what is happening. Uh, since we are talking about, um, about school safety, in terms of parent communication with secondary students, I, I'm a big proponent in the fact that Parents can act in a proactive nature to head something off at school before it happens. If during a conversation with your children, you hear something that has the potential to become a disruption, notify the school, notify your school counselor, notify someone that you have a relationship with at the school so that things can be headed off before they happen. I would say um, just communicate with your students, please. Also make a connection with your school resource officer as well. If you see something, say something. And just as I mentioned in the last session, the police department is hiring. 
I would offer that sometimes our teens don't want us to be looking and noticing. I would encourage you always to notice, always to look. We are our children's first teacher. We know them very, very well. Um, but there are things in this world that they have access to that as their parents, we may not have had access to. And so get curious with your teen, spend time, take that individual moment to talk with them. Even when they say they don't want to, they need you. They need us in their corner. They are, they are our future and we have to invest in them as, as parents. But honestly, they say they don't want you, but they do. Wow, so thank you all for those uh, words of uh, advice and wisdom. We wanna thank our community for joining us this evening, and I hope you're walking away with additional resources and or insights about our collective work to help our students achieve. Uh, well, we aren't finished. We will continue to have additional opportunities to discuss and problem solve, so stay tuned for upcoming dates in the near future. We will partner with our stakeholders and school leaders to plan other events to assist our schools and our school communities. I want to turn over to Dr. Zarchin. Any last words, Dr. Zarchin? Thank you very much. I just want to acknowledge we had several parents you know, ask questions about uh, related to COVID-19, mask wearing. Um, I just want to, again, stress the importance of our division's work uh, to keep our students safe, to keep them in school five days a week. Um, right now, there's a mask mandate in schools, but what we've learned is that the masks are keeping our students in school, not only because of preventing transmission, but when we have to do contact tracing, it really expands the range of students um, in proximity. Uh, our nurses have worked incredibly hard um, to do the contact tracing, to limit the spread of, of COVID uh, with our students. Certainly it's in the community. Um, I wish we had some more time to address that, but just want to acknowledge the questions and, and again emphasize, we're working incredibly hard to keep our students in five days a week. But with that, Dr. Williams, I want to thank you for your involvement and I'm going to turn it back to you. We want to thank you for that, Dr. Zarchin, and maybe more answers we can provide as you talked earlier about there's several questions that we were unable to answer tonight. We'll have it in a response, a written response. So again, stay tuned. Thank you families for joining us and you all have a good evening.